Hi there, Ward Bell of IdeaBlade here with an impromptu video talking about uh, Entity Framework performance issue uh, and what you can do about it. Just let me describe the context. We have a, a client and uh, the client has a modest size model of about 200 entities, uh, 200 tables, and they were trying to develop their application and it was taking 50 seconds to do the first query. Subsequent queries were really quick. And then on the first save, they'd pay another 50 seconds, and then the subsequent saves were quick. So there's some kind of analysis going on, obviously, uh, that is taking an incredibly long time. And this is absolutely insane if you're trying to do development and you're spinning up the uh, uh, Entity Framework server over and over and over again. So uh, something has to be done. And, and 200 entities is not a large uh, line of business model. So uh, at first we thought, well, you know, maybe it's our product. Oh my gosh. Uh, could it be something we're doing? So uh, before we totally panic, we stripped down their sample, threw everything all out. We have this one domain model project and it's got, uh, you know, their entity classes in it, their code first entity classes in it. Um, these other supporting things are, are harmless. Um, so, you know, I know I'm paired back to just doing Entity Framework and some code first classes. And um, here's the DB context for that. And it's nothing too remarkable in here. There's an on model creating where we do some uh, small amount of um, uh, configuration for things like many to many's and a table per hierarchy. You know, uh, but nothing, nothing too dramatic, and we'll see in a second that this has no consequences at all from a timing perspective. So it seems pretty uh, innocent and normal to us. So then we have a little test program around it. And uh, as the comment says, we'll perform a dummy query to time the first query. And then we'll use a real query to show that it doesn't uh, take so long for the second one. And then we'll make some changes to the first user and we'll save them and see how long that takes. You know, it's always possible that there's something in the database, right? So all I've got here is schema and one record in it. And uh, just to prove that I'm right about that, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna throw it away. And so we'll go back here and we'll see what we're really um, going to do. In the constructor, we're gonna spin up an instance of our DB context, which we just took a look at. And, um, then we're just going to get the uh, first uh, one we can find where the uh, ID equals minus one. There's no such animal, but who cares because we're just trying to get it going. We don't really care about data. Uh, subsequently, we'll issue a, uh, another, another query here for the very first one. And if we don't have one, as we won't when we're going to start up with no database, uh, we'll create one. And uh, then we'll report about it. And then we'll make some modest change to it, and we'll save it and time, uh, time that. And there's nothing really remarkable about that. Uh, it's probably worth uh, seeing how we set this all up. You'll notice that we're going to create the database if it does not exist. Uh, subsequently, we'll take that out of the picture just in case this was really causing any trouble, uh, and we'll see that it wasn't. So um, let's run it. Okay, and it started, and you can see it's got to the first dummy query. We're not to the second query, and it got that kicked off the DB context on model creating uh, that um, that we showed a second ago, and that finished. So we know in, in a fraction of time that that didn't really take any time. Meanwhile, we're going to sit here and we're going to tap our toes while waiting um, for our first dummy query to complete. Well, that took, what, 48 seconds or something on my machine. And then the next query ran really quickly. You can see, you know, 0.72 versus 0.75 in no time at all. But here we are trying to save our changes. We're going to tap our toes some more. Okay, and at last we're done. And again, it's another long uh, wait uh, until it does. Uh, just to show that it really has nothing to do with creating the database, now that we have this, uh, we'll just comment that out. And I um, uh, assure you that if you look at the, our startup here, it's 
you can see it's not doing any database initialization at all subsequently now that we have taken that out. And we can run this again and we'll see we're still waiting uh, for that to come back. Uh, while we're waiting, I will just bring up the database, show you that it really does exist here. If we go in there and we take a look at the table that uh, has the users in it, um, which is the only thing that we did anything with, uh, and um, we select the top 1,000 rows here, uh, we see that it just has the I'm a real user that we created uh, in this example. So uh, it surely isn't, doesn't have anything to do um, with the size of the data. But we're still um, going to be sitting here waiting, waiting, waiting. I don't want to wait anymore. It's taking the same time as it did last time. All right, so what could we do about that? Well, one thing we could do is we could say, well, what happens if the model is much smaller? Uh, how much smaller? By the way, I won't have to change the database at all. The database can be big, big. It's just that the, 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 um, uh, the model will be smaller. And I uh, happen to know that um, when I'm in my own model creating here, where I'm doing the configuration, will... Uh, if running the small model, we just bail out real early. So we'll have a very much smaller model when we do this. And when we run it, uh, we're done. Okay? See, that didn't take all that long. So this is why if you're just cranking around with some very modest examples, uh, you never run into this problem and you think everything is going to be hunky-dory. I suppose if you got to the size of AdventureWorks, we're looking at all of AdventureWorks, which has 100 entities in it, you would see it. But as soon as you start to get to your real work, man, are you in big trouble because there's no way in the world you can have all of your developers, every time they make a change and try and see what it looks like when they're running their application, sitting around, waiting 50 seconds for the first query to finish, and then waiting around for the second one to finish. Of course, by this time, you're deep into Entity Framework and you're worried. I know, I would be worried. So, what can we do about that? Well, let's go back and set this to false. Right, so that we know we're going to run with the real model next time. You won't see me uh, screwing around with that. What we're going to do is uh, get Entity Framework to pre-generate its view of the model it's working with. Not our model, but its view of the relationship between our model and the database, which it calls its views. So we're going to get it to pre-compile its views. And uh, there's a tool for doing that, and you can get it... Uh, through the extension manager. It's right here, the Entity Framework Power Tools. So you can just search for that. I just searched for Entity Framework Power Tools. And you can read all about it here, and you will find also that it is a work in, not only a CTP1, but it's a work in progress. But for our purposes, it works, it works quite well. And so I, I have installed this, and the way you use it is you find your DB context class, and you right click, and now that the, the tools are here, the power tools are here, you see there's an entity framework uh, entry in your context menu, and there's an optimized entity data model. And that's the thing you want. This is going to actually take as much time as that first query took, um, because it's going to do everything that that first query did. So um, it's telling you right down here in the status bar that um, this pre-compilation is going on, and it could take several minutes, so we'll just let that run. About that, it's done. It has created a class which has the same name as our DB context. It has .views.cs on it, and it looks like this. Well, we'll get. We may investigate this later, uh, but let's just put it away for now and see what consequence this has. Uh, let's confirm again. We're going to run the full 209 model. We're not going to do any database initialization. Just the code as it is. My fingers never leave my hands. I'm going to F5 here. And it's done. All right. Eight seconds for the first one. Um, that is um, a bit long for my taste, but it is in 50 seconds. And the saving user took practically no time at all, just like 0.2. So that is a vast 
vast improvement. And if for a 280 model, I hate the fact that I'm sitting around for seven or eight seconds, but that beats sitting around for 50. Uh, I'll take eight today, and I'm sure you'll be glad to have it too. That said, uh, I know you're curious. I'm curious too. What's going on in this views class? And um, see how little that is? That's because this thing is enormous. And in fact, for the 200 tables here, uh, it's got, it has these little get view methods that it creates, and there are some 400 of them. Uh, each of them is, um, looks like it's a, a SQL select statement. It's actually some other kind of statement, uh, all made up of concatenated strings. So here, you know, we have get view 412. If the, um, if the string would be small enough, then it's actually readable, but if it's uh, the string would be really long. Instead of creating one long string, they create appends, and there are various uh, variations on this. But the, the basic idea is that there's these get views. And then at the top here, um, <laughs> somehow, Entity Framework is going to call um, a get view at and plug a number in, and it's going to go through all this if stuff. Now, no way in the world a human being would actually write this. And perhaps it's going to look a little bit later, better later when they come out with a new version. Who knows? But if you're really thinking about it, you think, well, you know, maybe if I execute this only once, it's not a big deal. Who worries about it? You're only going to run it once. Uh, so let's put a breakpoint here and see what actually happens as we run it. We're, we're, we're taking it from the top again. And you can see we aren't even to the point of using this yet. Something else is going on. And at last several seconds in. So somewhere in that eight seconds, it's doing something else. And it's coming to here. Now, I have kind of a hint that what else it might be doing. And I'm looking up here, and I'm saying, that looks like a hash, doesn't it? Looks like a hash. So, um, you know, I'm going to take a bet that what it's doing is it's trying to make sure that our uh, pre-compiled view actually correlates well with our model, and maybe it's hashing the class uh, the, 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 all of our entity classes somehow and coming up with some hash and comparing it against this to determine if it's right. Because I can assure you um, that if we change the model, we're going to get an exception. But that's all future stuff. Right here, what we see is that we're coming in and um, it's, uh, you know, I'll do it again, and it's iterating through each of these 409 um, over and over again. Uh, but is it doing it once or is it doing multiple times? Let's find out. I'm going to uh, put a breakpoint right here after my first query is completed. I'm going to go back into the views, take this breakpoint out, and let her rip. Okay. Well, it really didn't take long, did it? For it to, um, that's real time, for it to uh, run through and, and use those pre-compiled views. That's a huge saving because we're right here. Um, ready to uh, start the second query. I'm going to take the breakpoint off there and put it on the save changes because I know what's going to happen here. I'm going to let it rip and look at that. We're right at save changes and now uh, when I go back into here and I put my breakpoint back on and I come back to here and I go F5. Oh, for reasons completely mysterious to me, uh, for the save, it's going to go through this, every single one of these views, so far as I can tell, all over again. So I don't know why it reads it twice, but it reads it twice. Uh, and if you think back to the two, fifth, you know, two chunks of 50 seconds we lost at the beginning, it's as if uh, without these pre-compiled views, Entity Framework Code First were, was reanalyzing the model twice in exactly the same way. That's probably why we were <laughs> paying that awful price. And uh, fortunately, now that we're using these, this, this pre-compiled view, all these strings and so forth, these string representations of, of what Entity Framework calls its views, um, we're good to go. So that's the inside scoop on pre-compiled views and why you might want to use them. Thanks for watching.